All right, welcome everyone to a new talk of the virtual seminar on geometry with symmetry. And today it's my great pleasure to welcome Jeff Streets from UC Irvine, who will be speaking on generalized Ricci flow. Welcome, Jeff. Okay, yeah, so uh, thanks so much for that uh, nice introduction and thanks for the invitation to speak in the seminar. It seems like a nice, uh, a nice idea. So yeah, so the, the talk is on is on this uh, generalized uh, Ricci flow and it's sort of, um, I guess, a, a survey of, of progress in, in different directions. Uh, so I won't really talk about proofs in too much detail, but of course we can maybe discuss later. So, um, so to start, what exactly is this uh, generalized Ricci flow? So if I fix a smooth manifold M, then uh, I say a one parameter family of metrics uh, G and then also closed three forms H is a solution to generalized Ricci flow if I have the following uh, equations. So, so we have this evolution for G. So, so G evolves by minus twice the Ricci tensor. That's the usual Ricci flow and then plus H squared. So this H squared acts on vectors X, Y. Um, by definition, this is, um, oh, sorry. H squared X, Y is the inner product of I, X, H, uh, I, Y, H. So it's a, it's a positive uh, semi-definite tensor. So this is the natural contraction of H with itself. And then H is evolving by the, the Hodge Laplacian heat flow. Okay. So the first thing to sort of notice about this is you can interpret it as sort of Ricci flow of a connection with torsion. Now, what does that mean? So, so if I have a pair um, G and H, then I can define a new connection where, so here D is the levi civita connection, and then I just add on one half G inverse H as some kind of torsion and call that connection Navla. Um, then you can compute, so, so the Ricci tensor uh, of this uh, is no longer symmetric, but it's expressed using the classic Ricci tensor. And then sort of, so the symmetric part is the classic Ricci tensor perturbed by this one fourth H squared. And then the skew symmetric part is D star H. Okay, and so, um, so you can equivalently think about this flow and this is sort of a fruitful way to think about it as a, a time derivative of a, a symmetric two tensor and then a skew symmetric two tensor. So the time derivative of G minus B is just minus twice this twisted Ricci tensor. And then you recover uh, H. Uh, of course, th this flow will preserve the cohomology class of H. So you expect it to reduce to a flow of two forms and indeed it does. And this is sort of how. So, so H is the initial uh, H plus dB and then B is evolving by D star H. Okay. So <clears throat> maybe a first thing I wanna point out is a, is a sort of key class of examples that I'll come back to uh, a few times, um, uh, which, which sort of illustrates that this flow has a, a broader class of fixed points than, um, than classic Ricci flow. So, we let K denote a semi-simple Lie group and fix a bi-invariant metric uh, G. Then we can say H is the, we call H the, the Carton three form, which we can define at least for left invariant vector fields using the, the Lie bracket, okay? So, so this, this form is, uh, is closed and uh, you can check that in fact, uh, so, so, so I guess on the previous slide, I didn't give these connections a name, but I tend to call them a Bismuth connection. So Bismuth was an early uh, advocate for the use of, the, of these connections. In any case, these, both of these connections, Nabla plus minus, where I take both plus and minus uh, one half G inverse H, these are actually flat, okay? So these are flat connections. So in particular, they're, they're fixed points of the flow because it's expressed in terms of the Ricci tensor of this, of this connection. And there's this classic result of Cartan Scouten going way back um, that in fact, all bismuth flat structures are quotients of, of this construction. So they basically classified what are flat connections of this type. They prove more than that, but uh, this is the only point I am interested in at the moment. And as Sorry, just a just, really, oh, please. Just to clarify that you call a bismuth connection just when the torsion is totally skew symmetric, right? Uh, well, yeah, and I guess for me, in any case, certainly for the talk and also closed, yeah. Um, oh, I like blurry, blurry. okay, uh, okay. But no Hermitian uh, condition here, so it could be all dimensional. Yeah. All right, okay, thanks. Yeah. 
yeah, maybe truly historically, it might not be the best name, um, but uh, but yeah, but I guess mostly I'm coming right from complex geometry where it, it seems to have this name. Um, but right, so yeah, so a, a very a very elementary uh, example of this that that'll come up a few times in the talk is is just SU two. So so the semi simple Lie group SU two, which is diffeomorphic to S three. G is the bi-invariant metric, and you can compute then that H is, well, is, is properly, properly some, some multiple of the volume form on S3. And, um, and so, so it, well, and in particular, already you can see that like generalized Ricci flow is gonna treat uh, spaces differently depending on whether this H field is turned on or not. So, so in particular, you might be, you might, Think that you could expect different behavior for the flow, depending on the cohomology class of H. So of course, like the, the round three sphere with H vanishing, this generalized Ricci flow will just be Ricci flow, which contracts the sphere to a point in a finite amount of time. But with the H field kind of turned on, so if the H field is non-trivial in cohomology, I mean, at least in this homogeneous setting, like you see, it's just a fixed point for the flow. So it will exist for all time. And I mean, it's already a, a stationary point is the, is the point. Okay, so so we so we might expect very different behavior depending on whether this field is kind of non-trivial or not. Uh, so what's the point really for for studying this then? So so we can ask some some perhaps a very broad questions uh, like can we expect this flow to detect some new topological geometric structures? Um, what exactly is the geometric significance of this torsion H? Um, and then in the second half of the talk, I'll discuss uh, what's the relationship of this flow uh, to, to complex geometry. And maybe I should also mention it, it, it does come up independently in mathematical physics literature a long time ago, uh, this equation. Um, so the point I want to kind of emphasize um, is that as far as I can tell, the, the answers to these questions uh, and really a lot of the analysis of the flow turns out to be very closely linked to this new and sort of not fully understood field of, of what's called generalized geometry, which sort of emerged in the last couple of decades, sort of um, from, from various places, but from, from work in mathematical physics, but then also sort of it kind of got its start in the mathematical world in this foundational paper of Hitchin on what he called generalized Calabi-Yau geometry, which is now called generalized complex geometry. Um, and it's kind of grown into a field of its own. All right. So I want to say just a, a few words about what this structure is, um, um, just to kind of give a little bit of a taste for it. And again, we'll see a bit more precisely, uh, like an application of this point of view later. Um, so generalized geometry, the, the sort of foundational starting point is to replace the tangent bundle with what's called the, the generalized tangent bundle, which is T plus T star. So this bundle naturally comes equipped with a neutral inner product. So defined this way, a symmetric neutral inner product. And then there's also a natural, well, there, there's a class of natural extensions of, of the Lie bracket. So as you can define a bracket structure, the one I've written here is, is so-called Dorfman bracket, um, which, which extends the, the Lie bracket on vector fields by these terms, which I can't really properly motivate in, in this talk. But in any case, it extends it by these, these terms involving natural operators on vector fields in one forms, but then also allows sort of natural from different points of view to allow for a further twisting by a closed three form. So it's sort of already just this kind of extension of the Lie algebra seems to encode uh, the structure of a closed three form, okay? Um, and so, 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 so this is sort of the replacement for, you should think of this as sort of the replacement for like the tangent bundle and the Lie bracket, kind of like the smooth structure. So the smooth structure now kind of means something different uh, for our manifold, but then what's the geometry? So, so a generalized metric um, is an orthogonal self-adjoint endomorphism of T plus T star, such that when you lower an index with a neutral inner product, you get a positive definite inner product on T plus T star. Now you can unwind the linear algebra of that. It's just sort of an exercise. And it turns out then that um, these conditions are equivalent to a pair of a, of a Ramanian metric and a two form. And, and you can then recover this endomorphism G 
uh, as follows. So, so this matrix is meant to be acting on t plus t star, and then I further conjugate by e to the b. Okay, and when you again, you can sort of grind out what this is as a product, and this is what it looks like. So it's some kind of twisting of um, like this this metric by a by a two form b. Okay. All right. So so that's uh, sort of the notion of metric in this setting. And I have to sort of very quickly gloss over an interesting part of the story, which is that there's not really an immediate analog of the levi civita connection in this setting, which is perhaps bad news. Um, but, uh, but there's this relatively recent work of Garcia Fernandez, um, where he showed that there's a sort of canonical class of, of connections on E. Um, defined by some metric compatibility and sort of kind of like a torsion free condition um, where the curvature tensors will actually still be distinct. It, it's, not, it's not a unique uh, connection, but actually they all have the same Ricci tensor. And, and so that's what's called uh, the generalized Ricci tensor. And so I write it here as, uh, as an endomorphism of T plus T star. And you notice it actually it involves the curvature of, of sort of both of these connections. So this kind of plus minus H duality is a, sort of recurring feature in, in this flow um, for whatever reason. Um, so so this, this Ricci tensor naturally uses the Ricci tensors of both plus and minus. Okay, and, and then from this point of view, uh, which I know is very abstract, I went over it very quickly, you can sort of recast uh, this PDE um, as in this fashion. So this generalized metric G evolves by minus twice this generalized Ricci tensor, okay? So at this level, it's maybe a more a formal construction, but again, we'll, we'll see a sort of more concrete application of this idea later. Um, okay. So, <clears throat> um, so to start uh, the analysis um, of this, uh, I'll just first say a few words that generalized Ricci flow kind of has the same basic regularity package as, as Ricci flow on the most basic level. So for instance, you can prove a general result saying that there's short time solutions on compact manifolds. It's not so surprising. You can prove solutions exist as long as the Riemann curvature stays bounded. Um, and perhaps a little bit more importantly, it's a, it's a gradient flow. So um, so, so you can define this functional uh, script f, which takes a metric, a three form and a function little f and returns uh, this integral. And um, so if you've studied Ricci flow, you'll of course recognize this as Perelman's f functional, but now further coupled with some energy measuring h. Okay, and then you, so you can just, define, yeah. Quick question, when you said Riemann curvature, you mean of the modified connection with torsion or? Just no, the I really mean of the Riemannian. Riemann, actually, yeah, oh, I really okay. mean Riemann. So, so, so no condition on H to okay. Yeah, and basically the reason is a, is a sort of nice fact. Basically, because the H squared term in the metric, sorry, the the H squared term in the time evolution of the metric is positive. You can prove a differential inequality like ah, okay, um, like this will be less than or equal to some constant times Riemann times norm h squared, but then minus norm h to the fourth. Okay. So, so you get this kind of favorable term. And so as long as as long as the curvature is bounded, sorry, it disappeared on me. As long as the curvature is bounded, the, the h fourth term gives some control. Um, but yeah, so so you can define this this quantity lambda where, where you take the infimum of script f over little f's, uh, which satisfy a unit volume condition. So again, this is exactly like, like Perlman's construction. And the, then the point is, this is a theorem of uh, Olinik, Sunita, and Wolgar from 2006, that this generalized Ricci flow equation is the gradient flow of this quantity lambda, okay? All right. Um, okay, but so, right. So, so this is kind of the, the most fundamental analytic properties, but we wanna try to prove some definitive long time existence results. So uh, I, I wanna describe such a result. So of course the first place where we can expect anything different from regular Ricci flow is, is dimension three, right? Because there's no three forms uh, in dimension two. Um, but we can still sort of obtain a flow related to Riemann surfaces by dimensional reduction. So, so here's where um, maybe some symmetry constructions come in. Um, 
So, so suppose uh, I have a, a three manifold, which is the total space of a principal circle bundle over a Riemann surface sigma. And I fix a metric G on sigma and mu uh, a principal connection. And then I can define, sorry, it's like a N plus one G's for any N, but, um, but so, so here uh, I define a metric capital G on M uh, using the pullback of the metric on sigma and then the principal connection. Okay, so this gives an S1, and this is like kaluza klein ansatz. you get an S1 invariant metric on the total space. If I identify the curvature F uh, with a two form on sigma, so F is uh, D mu, then I can further declare that my three form is of the form F wedge mu. And of course it will automatically be true just for dimensional reasons that it's closed. Um, uh, and then what's the point? So the point is, this is some initial ansatz I can imagine for the flow. Um, and the point is it's preserved by this generalized Ricci flow. And then you can sort of recast generalized Ricci flow with this initial data, capital G, capital H, in terms of a flow on the Riemann surface. And this is something I studied <laughs> a long time ago in my thesis, they call Ricci Yang Mills flow. So, um, so, so here, this, this is sort of happening like on, on the Riemann surface sigma. Um, so, so the metric is evolving by the Ricci flow plus now F squared instead of H squared. And then mu is evolving by Yang Mills flow. Okay. I mean, it's linear, it's like sort of like Maxwell, but anyways, it's, uh, it's Yang Mills flow. Um, Okay, so, so we can get some nice class of solutions sort of related to the geometry uh, of surfaces. And so a uh, theorem from last year gives a complete description of generalized Ricci flow uh, with this ansatz. So, so again, I, I fix basically this setup from before and, and then GT mu T is this Ricci Yang Mills flow solution on the, on the surface. And then capital G is the, is the associated metric on the total space, which is the solution of generalized Ricci flow. Then we have the following uh, behavior. So, so the point is that the, the behavior depends fundamentally on the topology of, of, of M. So, so, so in particular on the Euler characteristic of the base, but then also on the topology of the bundle. Um, so, so first, if the Euler characteristic of sigma is negative, then basically what we see is exactly what one sees just in the classic Ricci flow case. So you get global existence uh, for the flow. And then if I take this blowdown limit on the total space, it converges in a gromov hausdorff sense to the, to the base surface sigma with the canonical uh, curvature minus one metric uh, on sigma. So again, like if the, this is sort of the same whether the H field is turned on or off. Like qualitatively, it's exactly the same as the Ricci flow behavior. In the case of uh, like a, where the base is a torus, then again, what you see is um, essentially identical. Well, it's not quite identical, but the way I phrase it, it's identical to what happens in Ricci flow. So again, you get global existence of the flow. And again, if you take this blowdown limit, uh, you get convergence to a point. Um, there is one subtlety here where, um, of course, in the, in the regular Ricci flow case, you would just get convergence. You, you wouldn't really blow down and you just get convergence to a flat metric. But it would still be true that if you take the blowdown limit, you get convergence to a point. Um, here, if this H field is turned on or equivalently, like if a bundle is non-trivial, um, uh, you can, for instance, uh, you sort of get convergence to a flat metric, but it's expanding, like the volume is going to infinity as time goes to infinity. Um, but at a slow rate, such that when you still blow down, you still just converge to a point. Um, so, okay. Um, but then, so, so these are perhaps <clears throat> maybe not so interesting because you're getting exactly the same behavior as, uh, as Ricci flow. But so the sphere case gives us something sort of surprising. So, so but I, I have to break into two cases. So, so first, if the other characteristic is positive, so basically the case of a sphere and the, and the bundle is trivial, then again, I still see sort of exactly what happens for Ricci flow. So it'll exist on a finite time. So there's a finite time T where the flow exists. And then if I take this type one blow up at the singular time, so, so I have to rescale upwards uh, as, I, as I approach the, the singular time, then what I get is convergence to sigma cross R. So here, right, so I didn't, 
say this for cases one and two, but of course the fiber, the metric on the S1 fibers is just fixed along the flow. And so when I take these blowdowns, like the fiber is collapsing and that's why I'm getting dimensional collapse to the, to the surface. Whereas in this case, my, my metric on the fiber gets blown up and I get a product with R. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, but in any case, the, the blow up limit converges to um, sigma cross R with just a round metric cross with, uh, with a flat metric on, on R, okay? And so, yeah, so I mean, like the, the field H is present for the flow, but it's trivial in cohomology. And then somehow that means it doesn't really affect qualitatively the behavior of the flow. All right, but then finally, case four gives us something. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, may I ask you something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, this limit you get in, in this part three, uh, mm -hmm. it should be, be smooth, rich, flat, uh, because it's a fixed point, or? Well, no, it's not. I mean, it's like the H has disappeared in the limit, and, and, and it's just oh. like, it's like a, you're just getting the standard shrinking like S2, basically, while well, you're getting a product of that with R. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There's rescaling, right? So it's not a fixed point of the original yeah. equation. And in in the homogeneous case, uh, bismuth rich flat implies bismuth flat. Actually, no. So um, I wrote. This, so so yeah, I. I uh, in this book that we wrote, that I wrote with Mario on generalized Ricci flow, we asked this question, this like Alexiev uh, conjecture. I asked if this is the same. And uh, for, for, yeah, exactly, exactly the question you just asked. And it, it turns out it's false. Um, there was a paper on the archive just like last week, uh, I can send you, where they construct a five dimensional homogeneous bismuth Ricci flat structure, which is not bismuth flat. Ah, okay. So it's, is okay, okay, in dimension five, so it cannot be a semi simple Lie group, right? Okay. Oh, well, oh. So that's the reason why it's not be smooth flat, right? Okay. Uh, well, I mean, it is, uh, yeah, I mean, but I, okay, maybe I misunderstood the question. I thought. Because um, you, you say that be smooth flat is only semi simple Lie group yeah, quotient, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah, sure, yeah. Um, uh, okay, yeah, so, so then, and then what happens in this case four? So, so case four, we really finally see something, I think, surprising. Um, so, so this is, yeah, so the Euler characteristic is positive. So, so say sigma is S2, but the bundle is non-trivial now. So I, I asked that the, that the first turn class of the bundle be non-zero. Then you get global existence of the flow, and then you get convergence to a quotient of this bismuth flat S3 that I described. So like basically this standard structure on SU2 may be modded out by some finite group, depending on the topology of the, the depending on the first term class uh, of the bundle. And yeah, like what's kind of, you can kind of see that this should be true just by looking at the homogeneous setting, because sort of the, the homogeneous setting, you can think of the metric should be some multiple times the round metric. And then basically the ODE is DA DT is like minus one plus one over A squared. So, so somehow in the homogeneous setting, you can see that like uh, th this, this sort of bismuth flat structure should be a global attractor. Um, but then, yeah, but it really is true for the whole PDE. So I, I find this very satisfying. Like this, I find this case three and four very satisfying because we have a complete description that is completely different depending on whether this H field is turned on or not. But like so, so this condition of the bundle being trivial or not is precisely equivalent to the cohomology class of H being zero or not. So, so we can see it has a, a real effect um, on on the behavior of it. All right, so. Um, I'm going to sort of switch gears at this point and kind of move to, to complex geometry. I don't know. Any more questions maybe before I do that? Um, well, I have a question, but this is more of a more general question. So you mentioned uh, in one of your bullet points, like what type of structures are we hoping to detect with this flow? So maybe this gets answered in the second part. But uh, when you're looking at three dimensions, what, uh, what will be the 
the holy grail in this setup? Well, yeah, okay, that's 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 a good question. Um, I guess, yeah, uh, strangely, while well, I've spent more time on like the four dimensional case because I spent more time on like the complex geometric setting where the first non-trivial case is dimension four. And there, there are some new structures that I will discuss uh, right. a bit. Okay, like um, complex surfaces, yeah, that's uh, of course. Yeah, um, but uh, well, um, I do think it's, I think it's interesting that I think it's hard to argue that uh, this bismuth flat structure on S3 isn't somehow a relevant geometric object. And, and the fact that this flow can universally converge to it, at least in the symmetric setting is I think an interesting point. Um, however, yeah, I think in dimension three, even if one could just, uh, well, probably the conjectural picture of what it's really doing uh, in the long time limits at infinity, I would imagine a lot of those long time limits are actually the same as what's happening in region flow. Um, so yeah, I, I think a, a lot of the probably newer and more interesting behavior maybe starts in, um, in dimension four, although I will say, so, so I'll mention at some point this construction of non-trivial steady solitons that exist in dimension four, but actually they already exist in dimension three. So actually on S3, there exists these sort of steady solitons. So Ricci minus one fourth H squared plus Hessian F equals zero. So, so, so it's a classic fact from Ricci flow, right? That a compact steady soliton is trivial, is, is already Einstein. But it turns out that's not true for this generalized one. And, and in fact, there's, there's this one parameter family of solitons that includes the round metric. Um, and uh, well, yeah, and so, so there's some interesting kind of, uh, well, modified Einstein type metrics that exist. And then these, of course, are putative. Well, I mean, the flow will converge to them in some settings. So. Okay. And on, on, a yeah. on a semi simple Lie group, uh, do you know how uh, bismuth Ricci flat structures left invariant other than the, the B invariant one? Or, or um, is, the, is the one the, the... Uh, That I guess I don't know the answer. And actually, that, uh, yeah, I, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. So, that that question actually um, is is relevant to a result I'll say later. So so we can give um, like a proof in the complex geometric setting that sort of these bismuth flat structures on semi simple Lie groups are global attractors for the flow, but we're kind of missing some kind of like uniqueness results with some fixed cohomology characteristics. And I think it's basically more or less reduces to the question you just asked. Okay. Um, like you know you're getting some bi-invariant metric in the limit, but you're not exactly sure um, which one. Uh, um, yeah, but yeah, maybe we come back to that. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna switch gears now and describe um, the relationship of generalized Ricci flow uh, to to sort of to complex geometry. So. A very long and important story in, in math is that this complex Kähler geometry has a, this very deep interaction with, with classical Ricci flow, this is Kähler Ricci flow. And it turns out you can sort of extend this relationship to more general complex manifolds using this generalized Ricci flow equation. So let me just briefly recall how this goes. So if we're given now a Hermitian manifold, so, so a smooth manifold, a, a metric and a compatible integrable complex structure, we call it pluri-closed if, uh, so I define H to be DC omega, which is defined uh, like this. And I just ask that H be closed. So H is always some real three form associated to any Hermitian metric. And then I impose that it's, that it's closed, okay? And call that pluri-closed. <clears throat> so this is some natural linear integrability condition, which of course generalizes the Kähler condition. And a basic fact is that these things can be found Pluri-closed metrics can be found in abundance on every compact complex surface. This is a result of Godeschon, but in higher dimensions, they may not exist. Um, 
And an interesting just sort of general philosophical point is that uh, the sort of the local generality of these particles metrics is of a one zero form. So there's no scalar potential theory for such metrics um, like there is in Kähler geometry, but you do at least have this kind of one zero potential like this, which determines the metric locally. All right, and so it turns out, uh, I'll just sort of describe the way we discovered this historically. There's a, there's a natural geometric flow adapted to the setting of, of pluriclosed metrics, which we call pluriclosed flow. So I just quickly write this down. So, so we can write it down as an evolution of the Kähler form um, as follows. So, so here I just kind of give this local expression in coordinates. So here you recognize this sort of classic uh, like Ricci ten. This would, this would be the Ricci tensor in, in Kähler geometry, but not in general, but then it's further perturbed by terms involving the, the torsion, the, the failure to be Kähler. So minus dd star omega minus d bar d bar star omega. And you can compute that for a pluriclosed metric, the symbol of this is, uh, is, the, is the Laplacian in coordinates. So it has some short time solutions. Um, but more importantly for us, uh, I just want to quickly connect back uh, to what I've been discussing. So given a pluriclosed structure, I define H to be DC omega as before. And then I define theta to be the so-called Lie form. So, so, so you take D star omega, this is now a one form and compose with J, call that the Lie form. And it turns out, this is a theorem of myself and Tian from a long time ago now. Um, so if you have a solution to pluriclosed flow like this, you, you get metrics GT and, and HT uh, as above. Then the point is, well, they, they satisfy not quite generalized Ricci flow, but a, but a gauge modified version of generalized Ricci flow. Okay, so, so this is exactly the generalized Ricci flow equations, but then now further modified by this, by this Lie derivative term. Okay, so the, the way to interpret this is generalized Ricci flow will preserve this, this pluriclosed condition, but only after a non-trivial flow of J. So if I truly want to say that I'm talking about generalized Ricci flow, then I have to pull back J as well. To, I mean, G, yeah, if all I do is, is study this flow, then G, for instance, won't stay compatible with J. It'll stay compatible with the pullback of J by the relevant diffeomorphism. Okay. All right, so, um, so again, yeah. So the first time this flow is, is giving something new, uh, would be on complex services or complex dimension two. So what kind of behavior might we expect on, uh, on non-Kähler surfaces? And so to set the stage, I wanna mention this, uh, this nice <clears throat> classification of Godeshawn Ivanov from 1997. This isn't exactly how they state it, but it's basically what they prove. I just sort of rephrase what they prove. So <clears throat> um, if I fix a compact complex surface with a pluriclosed uh, metric, and I, and I impose these fixed point conditions for pluriclosed flow. So this is just to be a, a fixed point on the nose. So um, um, these are, so, so I impose these equations and the point is you have a very strong uh, sort of rigidity phenomena, if you will. So yeah, there's two possibilities, either H is zero and it's just Kähler Kalabi Yao. So, so the kind of, the, the Kähler case uh, is there of course. But then if H is non-zero, there's only really one very constrained class of solutions. So the, the four manifold has to be um, this uh, so-called standard hop surface. So I take C2 and remove the origin, and then I mod out by a certain action of Z, which is just dilation in each factor. And then moreover, I have to impose that the, the two moduli have the same uh, size. So these two uh, alpha and beta have the same norm. So this is a, called a, a standard hop surface. Um, it's diffeomorphic to S3 cross S1. And then I just call the complex structure J alpha beta. So that's the surface. And then the metric is just the round metric uh, direct sum standard metric on S1. And H is DVS3. So in fact, this is, based, this, is this bismuth flat structure from before. Okay, so this is the same. It's just this, the SE2 bismuth flat structure product with S1, that's it. So that's the only possible um, fixed point. Um, and so, well, that's, so, so we could maybe hope that the flow would kind of find this uh, starting on that manifold. 
but then we can also so so we notice as far as fixed points are concerned we only have like one possible manifold that we're talking about but so what is what's going on with some other non-calar surfaces well it turns out that a lot of them arise as elliptic vibrations so in particular any complex surface with cadaver dimension one is an elliptic vibration and only multiple fibers occur. And so it's finitely covered by a principal torus bundle over a Riemann surface of, of negative Euler characteristic. When the cadaver dimension is zero, again, you only, it's again, has to be an elliptic vibration and only multiple fibers occur. And this time it's finitely covered by a principal torus bundle over a Riemann surface, uh, which is with Euler characteristic zero. And then, when the Kodaira dimension is, is negative infinity, um, these standard hop surfaces discussed here are, of course, they're also principal T2 bundles uh, over, over S2, CP1. Okay. So, so one of the S1 factors is, is trivial. That's this one. And then the other one is like the hop vibration. Okay. So in particular, if we just kind of uh, put together the discussion of the, of the previous few slides, we know that this pluriclose flow is really sort of generalized Ricci flow in disguise. And at least on these surfaces, um, we have some kind of invariant or we have some kind of group action we can work with. So this sort of immediately, so, so I, I only stated the, the, the result on generalized Ricci flow from before for S1 bundles, but it's very easy to extend it to, to TK bundles, to, to arbitrary torus bundles. Um, and so you kind of immediately get the following corollary. So, so um, I'll sort of go through it a bit more quickly because it's really just the same statement from before in disguise. So if I fix a compact complex surface, it's now the total space of a holomorphic T2 principal bundle over a Riemann surface sigma, then I have the following um, statements. So if the Euler characteristic is negative, then my invariant, so, so I have to impose an invariant pluriclose flow. And what's interesting is actually simply imposing that it's torus invariant and pluriclosed actually puts it into the ansatz I discussed, which is really stronger than just the invariance. So the T2 invariance alone, for instance, allows the metric on the fibers to maybe vary in space, but the fact that it's pluriclosed fixes it. Uh, but in any case, uh, in this setting, you get global existence and then the blowdown limits converge to the base surface with the constant curvature minus one metric. And Similarly, if the, if the base has vanishing Euler characteristic, then the invariant pluriclose flow exists globally and the blowdown limits converge to a point. And then I have these two cases. One is S2 cross T2, so the case of a trivial bundle. Um, then again, I, I get a finite existence time now, and then the blow up limits are converging to like the round S2 cross with R2, flat R2. And then finally, there's the case of the hop surface. So again, this is sort of the an analogous to this S3 with a non-trivial, uh, or, or the, the, the base is a, is a sphere and you have a non-trivial bundle. And then again, the behavior is as we discussed. So if you have a torus invariant pluriclosed flow, then you get global existence, and then you just get convergence to some multiple of this standard hop metric. Okay. Uh, sorry, I didn't give it a name, but but this this metric from the godeschon ivanov theorem, which is just the bismuth flat structure on S3 cross with a metric on S1, they call that the Hopf metric. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> um, so so this sort of exhausts uh, the 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 T2 invariant uh, flow on on surfaces, but suppose we want to now like remove this this uh, this this invariance assumption and, and go a bit farther so so here um, I want to I want to describe a, a recent result uh, um, which proves some global existence results without the symmetry hypothesis and here we, we really do I'm going to go sort of all the way back to the beginning and we, we really do use this connection to generalized geometry it's it's a little bit invisible in in the proofs or in the theorems I discussed so far but here it's absolutely essential so um, so it turns out you can recast this pluriclosed flow uh, using the language using what is called a holomorphic Krant algebraid and this is more or less implicit in this old paper of bismuth on the index theorem um, for for non-Kähler manifolds, so so this is going to be very reminiscent of of this generalized metric discussion from earlier. So so I define now this holomorphic vector bundle Q, which is T one zero plus lambda one zero, 
And I define a, a twisted D bar operator. So, so these are holomorphic vector bundles. They, they, I have a D bar operator already on this, but I'm gonna twist it further. So, I, so, so given some pluriclosed metric omega naught, I define a new D bar operator, which is just the standard D bar operator, but then I, but then I couple using del omega naught. Okay. So the fact that um, this is truly a D bar operator, the fact that it squares to zero is precisely equivalent to omega naught being, being pluriclosed. Okay. Now, suppose I fix this kind of background and now I fix another pluriclosed metric, but I impose a sort of cohomological condition, which is that the difference of these torsion forms is exact. So del omega minus del omega naught is d bar beta, where here beta will be a two zero form. Then I can define a Hermitian metric on this vector bundle. So, so this is some nice holomorphic vector bundle now, q d bar omega naught. And then this capital G is just a Hermitian metric on that bundle. Now here, there's nothing, um, I mean, I sort of mentioned that like in, in this sort of generalized geometry interpretation of generalized Ricci flow, there's th all this delicacy involving connections and curvature. Here, there's no such thing. It's just a Hermitian metric on a particular holomorphic vector bundle. It has a churn connection. It has curvature, et cetera. So, so this, this, is, this G is some Hermitian metric. I can define its churn connection. And then that thing has, uh, curvature tensor, and then you can define this so-called like Hermitian Yang Mills curvature operator. I call SG. This is where you take the trace over the bundle of the. Uh, sorry, you, you take you take the trace over the two-form component of curvature, and then you get an endomorphism of the bundle. That's what I call this Hermitian Yang Mills operator, SG. And then the kind of amazing fact um, is that uh, the vanishing of this of this Hermitian, but basically this Hermitian Yang Mills curvature is exactly equivalent to these curvature operators in pluriclosed flow. It's sort of exactly equivalent to the bismuth curvature, if you like. So in particular, this this SG vanishes precisely if you have the the fixed point equations for for pluriclosed flow. And then what's even more, you can completely recast pluriclosed flow as a flow of metrics uh, on this on this bundle Q. So, and in particular it it kind of looks temptingly similar to Hermitian Yang Mills flow. So on some formal level, this is exactly Hermitian Yang Mills flow, but of course, in, in the traditional Hermitian Yang Mills flow setting, the, the metric on the base space is fixed, uh, is part of the background structure. Whereas here, uh, of course, this S is defined using the moving Hermitian metric on the base. So everything is just coming from the, from the solution of pluriclosed flow on the base. Okay, but nonetheless, uh, this, this language allows for some really strong maximum principles that lead to the following theorem. So, <clears throat> so this is a joint work from, from last year with my student, Josh Jordan and Mario Garcia Fernandez. So we proved two, two theorems. So first, it fix a, a compact uh, complex non-Kähler surface of non-negative Kodaira dimension. Um, and uh, if I fix any pluriclosed metric on M, then I can prove uh, the global existence. So the solution of the flow exists globally. This was the case when the blowdown limits were either giving like, uh, um, like hyperbolic metrics on higher genus Riemann surfaces or blowdown or, or, or convergence to a point. And of course that's what we expect in general to be true, but cannot quite prove that. Um, and then second, we give a complete uh, description on the standard hop surface. So, so I fix uh, a standard hop surface. Um, and uh, if I fix um, an arbitrary pluriclosed metric on M, then the solution of pluriclosed flow exists globally and will converge to this, to this hop metric. Okay. And actually, yeah, so maybe this is the part that's maybe related to, to Jorge's question. So, um, so, so a theorem very similar to this is true in any dimension where you're studying the flow on um, a semi-simple Lie group with a, with a, with a left invariant complex structure. Um, and the, the part that's, well, we get a particularly strong statement in, in dimension four because of this classification result of Godeshan Ivanov that you literally know on the nose very rigidly every limit. But here in general, all you would be able to prove is that it just converges like to some bismuth flat structure, basically. Um, 
Okay, yeah, and uh, yeah, so so this item two uh, gives a you know complete picture of what this flow is doing in the only case the one has a non kähler fixed point. Um, and the proofs, yeah, so the proof of these, again, I don't really have time to, to do it justice, but um, the point is, uh, because of this really nice uh, kind of compact formulation in terms of the curvature of this metric capital G, this generalized metric G, you can get some really nice sort of analogs of the parabolic Schwartz lemma um, for the generalized metric G. Um, where, for instance, in this case two, we have to use some nice background structure. And in, in case two, of course, the background structure we're using is the bismuth flat metric. The, this, this is equivalent to like a flat connection on the bundle Q. And, and basically you compare to that flat connection, you get some very strong estimates. Um, whereas in the case of, of uh, item one, we, we use like the fibration structure to, to get some sort of partial estimates on the metric. Um, you, you, you get some projection operators. And then again, you apply the parabolic Schwartz lemma to get some nice estimates. Um, okay, but uh, yeah, okay. So, so we have a reasonable picture in, in some cases of, of what this flow is doing, but there's still a long way to go. There's lots of other complex surfaces one would wanna study. For instance, there's even, there's even more hop surfaces. There's these so-called like non-diagonal or like non-standard hop surfaces so-called class seven plus services, parabolic in a way, hyperbolic in a way, et cetera. So what might we expect uh, this flow to do? Um, well, it turns out to be fruitful to kind of turn to uh, this, this gradient flow formulation. So, so I mentioned, so again, this pluriclosed flow, it's an instance of generalized Ricci flow that has this gradient flow formulation with this F functional. So in some cases, it's reasonable to assume the flow is probably non-singular. It exists for all time, has bounded curvature. So maybe what you get is not convergence to a fixed point, but convergence to a soliton. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so here I write down, th these are really the, the fixed point or, or, or the, the critical point equations for this lambda functional I wrote down before. And you see there's something delicate going on so so yeah so it's it's like it's like a Ricci soliton equation but of course further coupled uh, to H in some way, and you know the the fixed point equation for pluriclosed flow looked very similar except this this grad F was like this leaf one, <laughs> um, but it turns out you well th there's there's something delicate happening there and and this is really sort of um, the the more general uh, fixed point equation. Um, and sort of what's what's happening in disguise is that in dimension four, in the only example that exists, the theta is actually parallel. So that Lie form term is not actually really there. But anyways, uh, um, it, it is there for 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 other other solitons. Um, but so in any case, we could consider trying to solve this more general uh, equation. So Jeff, um, one would expect perhaps after rescaling to see some multiple of the metric uh, in that equation as well, right? Well, yeah, so, um, yeah, okay, so that, that's true. So, so if we're taking maybe like some, some blow up limit or blow down limit or something. Yeah, like, like something Einstein or, you know, soliton with, with non-zero, like non-steady yeah. soliton. Right, so um, there isn't like a, well, basically any reasonable definition you give of like a, of a shrinking or expanding soliton for this generalized Ricci flow pretty much instantly forces H to just vanish um, in the shrinking oh, really? and expanding cases. Basically okay. it's, it's kind of just because like the cohomology class should be fixed, but it's also shrinking like homothetically. So the only way that can happen is if it's zero. So yeah, so it's kind of, it's, I mean, I think of that more as like a feature than a bug though, that these finite time singularities are sort of ought to be more rigid really um, in some sense, but uh, <clears throat> yeah, but that's true in, in general, in general, what I'm talking about or what I'm talking about here is just like sort of steady solitons. Yeah. Whereas in general, maybe there's some shrinkers or expanders or something. Okay. But so the theorem from a few years ago now 
um, uh, is that in fact, there are steady soliton metrics on all of these so-called class one hop services. So class one hop services, this is uh, the same, it's the same construction. You take C2 minus the origin, and then you mod out by Z1, Z2 goes to this. It's just this diagonal action, alpha Z1, beta Z2. But here I'm no longer imposing that, that the two moduli are the same. So these are genuinely distinct uh, complex surfaces um, and, uh, and they will not admit a fixed point of the flow, right? Because the godeshan ivanov theorem tells you, you know, precisely which complex manifolds uh, occur, um, but they do admit solitons, okay? So it's kind of a new conceptual feature that, that these compact steady solitons really do exist. Okay. And I just mentioned a few other uh, results. Uh, so, so, so after these were discovered, I kind of gave a, a different, a better derivation of them joint with Yuri Ustinovsky uh, and show that they're in fact generalized Kala. And uh, maybe there's no time to go over this, but this is a, a structure which has, basically the point is they're compatible with a second complex structure as well. There's a second complex structure relevant to them. And then I just, again, mentioned this more recent result. So, uh, we proved that sort of in the class of, of generalized Kähler solitons, um, they're unique up to automorphism. So, so basically there's a, yeah, so, so there's a complete classification of solutions to, to this equation, which are compatible with this generalized Kähler structure. And they're just this class of explicit examples. So other than, than like kähler kalabi yau they're just this class of explicit examples on the, on the hop surface. Um, Okay, so yeah, I guess uh, I should probably stop there. So yeah, uh, thank you. Thanks for your attention. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Very nice talk. And are there any questions for the speaker or comments? Yeah. Feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah, can, can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah go ahead, Enrique. Good. Hi. Hi. Thanks for the talk. That was very interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so um, I was wondering if we go one dimension up and consider, say, non kala three folds, for instance, um, sort of full Yao setting, right? Of um, torus vibration now over a, over a K3 surface, right? Uh, do you think, I mean, I, is this, I mean, this sort of classifications are these obtained uh, um, in, in, in this setting as well? Uh, I mean, the, the, the um, topology, I mean, the K3, uh, uh, I mean, there's more stuff to describe than just the Euler characteristic, right? But what one, one would expect to be able to, to find the sort of same class of, of, of classification, the same type of classifications? Um, yeah, well, let, let me just say one thing, which is that uh, actually, yeah, so I have some work going with Mario at the moment where we show that this, um, yeah, like this, this whole Strominger system, uh, at least some yeah. flavor of it can, can sort of be dissolved into this framework and that you can think of this generalized Ricci flow as a flow for solving this like Strominger system. Um, but it's not, well, it's not exactly the same as the Fuyao ansatz, but um, so yeah, I mean, giving, uh, okay, yeah. Like, but to, so more precisely to answer your question, I mean, I suppose like trying to classify, so backing away from that and just asking like classify fixed points on complex three yeah. fields with a, with a T2 exactly. action, probably that's not exactly. unreasonable. I've not tried to do that, but yeah. I mean, I think probably there still should be, I mean, you have this extremely strong rigidity in dimension four, probably there's still something. I mean, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if it was still fairly rigid in dimension six. Because Fuya will give you a, a critical, a critical point, right? So their their solution is a non is a transitive algebraid in in the same sense that you guys are looking at, right? You, you still I'm get not a completely sure. I mean, H I guess flux. You get a flux which is not exact, and then right. And is it is it closed? I mean, does it exactly solve yeah. like a PDE of this form? Well, I don't. I haven't thought about it from this perspective. So that that would be a, a question to you. You are really the authority. But uh, what is true is that you what 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 is trying to do over there is uh, solve the anomaly constellation in a way right. that is uh, with right. an H flux which is not exact. But right? you want it to be transit strictly transitive. Yes. Uh, uh, as a, as an algebra, and um, what well, they appear to do that. 
So, uh, so well, what is, yeah, what is... I think the difference is that they, um, the, I think there's, uh, they, they make a specific choice of, of connection on, there, there's like these two vector bundles around, they make, they impose Absolutely, yeah. The, yeah. the turn connection of the base metric on the tangent bundle, which um, yeah. the sort of, the, the approach to this from generalized Ricci flow uh, is more agnostic about the choice of connection on that bundle. That's why I'm a little bit, I feel a little bit unsure making a hard statement about the relationship. And maybe one thing I can mention is that you sort of said, uh, as you said, they, they sort of are imposing like this conformally balanced and then they're trying to sort of solve the anomaly cancellation formula. Whereas again, the generalized Ricci flow point of view is kind of complementary. There, the natural way to fit it into our framework is to already ask for the anomaly cancellation equation. That's basically equivalent to the, to the relevant H on the total space being closed. And then, um, mm. and then you're trying to solve for like the remaining equations basically, which are. So, I mean, so if you were given, go ahead. no, no, I get it. I get it. So if you were given say one of those critical points, now I'm not just talking about Fourier, right? So if you were given say a solution of the Stronger system, which will very likely be a, a critical point for you for your functional. Um, would, do, do you think it might be worth looking at the stability profile, the sort of sec, sec variation around it? Is there interesting stuff to be learned from, from this kind of study? Or I mean, from the I mean, perspective of your- Actually, my, my student, I have a student, Kwang Kui Li, who just, he has a paper on the archive from like a month ago or something uh -huh. on stability. He analyzes the second variation of this Lambda operator in broad generality. And as far as I'm aware, that's the only like hard detailed look at the second variation when the H is, is non-trivial. And, and, and he, what kind he of stuff does, does he find? Um, yeah. He proves some results on like bismuth flat structures. Um, but he hasn't looked yet at these at these other, but I'm breathing down his neck to do so. So <laughs> all right, thanks. That's great. Well, you know, we, we've been working on these uh, G2 Strominger system solutions on mm -hmm. circle bundles over threefold. So so in fact, my interest really is in uh, doing the G2 picture, all of this. Yeah. And then um, but they, they look a lot like your first example for three manifolds, right? So, so your non-trivial circle bundles over the surface. So in this case, you have a circle bundle over some cloudy hour or before, and then right. which parts of the narrative still survive in any meaningful way. So we're, we're looking into that. So if, you're, if your student decides to go to seven dimensions or, <laughs> or Mario would so be a great person to advise that, but uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we've been thinking about this sort of very recently. So uh, Sure, sure. Yeah, no, it sounds interesting. Cool, very interesting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Ramiro, if I spoke too much. Sorry. Uh, no, no, discussions are always welcome. It's and really interesting. Don't apologize. I, I just have a stupid question. Perhaps this is very basic, but when H is exact, is that then the flow equivalent up to gauge to the Ricci flow? No, yeah, uh, okay. no, it's not. I mean, somehow, uh, even. I mean, what would you be asking for? This is now like sort of db squared. This should be lxg or something. I, I don't, ah, so, yeah, I don't. So, I don't think so. Because you seem to imply that when hate is not it's exact, exact, sorry, then uh, somehow all the results reduce to the Q flow, but this is maybe a feature of low dimension. So. Well, it's, yeah, I mean, well, yeah, like the, the the sort of limiting behavior of the PDE is sort of the same as if H was never okay. there to begin with, I suppose. But but the actual there's there's no way to sort of like plug in to existing results. I mean that the the flow right. is true is genuinely different in the end. And I just um, wanted to make a comment about this uh, theorem that solitons in this case are generalized scalar. In fact, we have a paper with Romina uh, about pretty close on homogeneous spaces and in particular in a class of uh, almost a billion probable Lie groups. And, and in fact, we do get the same result that the solitons in the limit, so the flow up to, I mean, it exists for all times and it converges up to scaling to solitons. These are true expanding solitons, at least in the metric sense they are. I guess the H might be exact, we haven't checked that because we didn't have that language, but, but as a matter of fact, we also found that they are generalized scalars. Oh. I think that's interesting, yeah. 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 Well, and yeah, maybe I mentioned um, 
so so this this theorem I claim basically we give a, like a classification of all these generalized Kähler Ricci solitons, but <laughs> it ought to just be the case that these are the only like pluri closed solitons, period. Um, right. And and it may be I think it's possible in dimension four that there's always kind of a second complex structure or a second almost complex structure that you can associate in dimension four and hopefully somehow these field equations like imply that it's integrable but that's it's more just a, a hope but i i'm pretty sure it's true but yeah it's it's kind of a remarkable thing that like uh, they want to be as <laughs> rigid yeah. as possible or something yeah Otherwise, that's interesting yeah that but that's yeah. very interesting yeah. so are there further questions for the speaker well if not let's Thanks, Jeff, again for a beautiful talk. Thank you. Recording now. <laughs>